welcome everybody to our fifth mentoring hub session now so i'm um, talking about emotional intelligence today um so let us have a look this is me if you need to contact me there's my details there um and obviously sue's details as well um please feel free to drop me a line if you if you feel the need to now i'm going to make a request if i may now you don't have to but if you could it would be absolutely wonderful if we could see your faces just um basically so that um we can just keep a track of, of how you guys are going um and we're talking about emotional intelligence so i don't want to make sure that i haven't triggered you in any way um that nobody's feeling upset so if we can see your faces that would be wonderful and it just makes it a little bit more engaging however totally up to you totally optional so entirely up to you um, so I just want to start by making um, an acknowledgement of country so in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the on the land on which we meet today um, so Queensland University of Technology acknowledges the Turubu and Yagara as the first Australian owners of the lands where QUT now stands. We pay respects to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and we recognise that these lands have been places of teaching, research and learning. QUT acknowledges the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders play within the QUT community and across, of course, all across Australia. Um, so what we would like you to do, as we have done with our other webinars, if you're happy just to um, place in the chat box the lands where uh, you're from today um, so that we can learn um, and gain awareness, essentially. That would be fabulous. Now, I'm going to have to rely on you, Sue, because I can't see chat boxes anymore. They've all disappeared now, started screen sharing. So if anything comes up in the chat box, I'll have to uh, rely on you, Sue. Is that okay? Yes, I will. I will do chats. And, um, and Regina, we, um, if, you, if you've got unstable internet, turn your video off. We don't mind if it's unstable internet and it's, in, and it's going to make people freeze and you miss the message, then please turn your video off. Beautiful. Oh, we got John. Beautiful. And John's popping in and we've got, um, and just people are putting in where they're from. We've got more um, Yugara and Purable people with us. We've got Larika people from the Northern Territory and we've got Nunga, Andy's Nunga. So we've got, and I'm Warpay tribe out here in um, Ipswich. So yeah, we've, we've got some people popping in. So it's fabulous. Fantastic. Thanks everyone. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Alrighty, let's jump through these ones. We don't need to see those ones. All right, so objectives of the session today. So basically, just want to explore what emotional intelligence is. Um, why is it important? Um, and just trying to understand that relationship between our emotions um, and the behaviours that we display and identifying that if we can understand our emotions, then we can change our behaviours. Um, and likewise, understand our behaviours and work back and change our emotions as well. Um, so um, also want to just be able to identify um, three positive emotions that we can learn to um, adapt and enhance um, just to really help us in the workplace so that we are a little bit more um, emotionally intelligent. Okay, so self care and compassion. Yeah, so we're going to be speaking about subjects that might cause you to feel strong emotions. Um, they might trigger potentially trigger an emotional response. Um, I want to keep this as a safe zone where we can respect one another's feelings um, and maintain respect and confidentiality in the group as well. Um, now this session is recorded. If at any point you feel um, you don't want to take part in the recording, that's fine. Just please just do turn your camera off. That's absolutely fine. Please just drop us a line there to let us know that you're okay. Um, uh, or if in retrospect you feel, do you mean the conversation that we've just had, I actually don't want that recorded, just drop myself or Sue a line, that's absolutely fine. When we pop this up online, we'll make sure that that bit's edited out. So that's absolutely fine, not a problem. Is that all okay? Everyone sound all right with that? Alrighty, so emotional intelligence. Okay, so research shows that emotional intelligence is a key factor identified in high performing achievers and leaders. But what is it? All right, so Emotional intelligence, it can increase your leadership abilities, uh, it can increase your team performance, uh, improves decision making, decreases workplace stress, reduces staff turnover and increases personal well-being. But what is it? Who, I mean, we hear the word banded around all the time. What's your guys' um, concepts of what emotional intelligence is? I'm going to stop sharing this just for a second, just so I can see your faces. That's better. What's your concept? What's your idea so far of what emotional intelligence is? Or what an emotional um, intelligent person might look like, maybe? Hello, me too, me, it's Jenny. Hi, oh. Jenny. Hiya. Um, I reckon it's actually um, having 
not only identifying and recognizing your emotions, but actually being able to manage them. So it's okay to feel angry, it's okay to feel sad, or it's okay to feel positive, but it's also how you how you manage them or how you actually demonstrate them without it being detrimental to anybody else. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's about that identifying what your emotions are um, and intercepting them before we start to see a negative behaviour. Absolutely. Now, who's heard of emotional intelligence um, discussed as a soft skill? Anyone heard that? Yeah. What, what are your thoughts about emotional intelligence and this terminology soft skill? I think it actually underestimates how difficult they actually are. I think it's, um, I think it actually devalues. Um, I think it's extremely hard. Yes, I personally. would very much agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. So we use this terminology soft skill, don't we? We see it on perhaps job adverts and things like that. Soft skills, blah, blah. Do you mean need, need all these skills? Absolutely right. Um, we, uh, I just defined earlier what uh, raising emotional intelligence can actually do. do you, I mean, it's, it's the top key indicator for high achievers, high, you know, high quality leaders. Yes, if we haven't got emotional intelligence, we're not really doing very well, particularly in the team dynamic. Yeah. So it's it's essential. Yeah. Soft skill, absolutely right. Totally underestimates its worth um, and, it, and its value. So uh, a really high value skill to have. Alrighty, let's have a look at what emotional intelligence actually is, though. OK, so emotional intelligence is all about understanding and expressing emotions and monitoring our behaviours. Right. Um, so we need to look at our psychological makeup. So essentially, these are the three factors that make up a psychological makeup. So your intelligence quotient, so your IQ um, and also your personality are generally fairly static. Right. You can't you don't really change them all that much after birth. They kind of rely, stay as they are. However, emotional intelligence, we certainly can adjust. We certainly can develop um, and hone. Yeah. All right. So these things together, they um, make us who we are. They determine um, how we interact with one another. Um, and we use these three elements in, in varying degrees as well. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. All right. So all three areas um, can work independently, but can work together as well. Can we measure emotional intelligence? Um, well, yes, we can. Yeah. So as we can measure intelligence but, yeah, with your IQ score, we certainly can um, measure emotional intelligence. Um, so I'm just going to click on this link here. Now, all of these, this PowerPoint is actually up on the learning management system. So um, you can follow this and you can go in and have a look at this um, Leadership Foundation um, uh, emotional intelligence score, if you like. Can you see that on the screen there? Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. OK, um, so, yeah, so essentially um, trying to measure emotional intelligence, it's basically looking at measurements of um, being aware of emotions, expressing emotions, controlling your emotions um, and also relationship management as well. So essentially, there's four key areas that um, emotional intelligence and emotional um, quotient looks at. Um, so you've got your self-awareness. Yeah. So looking at self-recognition. Yeah. So self-awareness, the inwards looking aspect. So your self-confidence, um, your own emotional awareness. Um, second aspect is social awareness. So your social recognition. Yeah. So that's outwards looking. So it's things like your um, emp empathy for others, um, understanding the needs of your team um, and the, or members or organization. Um, third one is self management. So that's self regulation. So again, inwards looking. So it's that self control in intuition aspect of things. Um, and the last one is relationship management. So outwards looking again. So your people skills sort of networking, conflict resolution skills, that kind of thing. Alrighty. Um, and that was actually identified by um, Daniel Goldman. So Daniel Goldman was a lead a researcher um, and um, identified the concept of emotional intelligence back in the mid 1990s. Alrighty, so we keep talking about emotions. What are emotions essentially? So I'm not talking about the chemical physiological stuff just yet. What 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 is an emotion? What is it? Can anyone define it for me? So are we broadly looking at like the way we feel those things that are happy, sad, Board. yeah what is it what, how, how would you define what an emotion is what is it a state of being state of being yeah absolutely mm. yeah influenced by anything your environment beautiful um yeah stimuli yeah. 
History. Uh, history, yeah. yeah. History, good one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, a feeling um, or a reaction influenced by circumstance, um, by mood, um, or perhaps relationships with other people as well. Um, and certainly, we all react very differently, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm. And how we um, into interpret the world um, can be molded by our emotional responses. Yeah. So, because of our emotional response, we might all be in the same situation, but we will all respond to that potentially slightly differently because of our individual emotional responses. Um, and if we aren't processing this information effectively, um, our emotions are going to take the lead on that. And that is not always a favorable outcome. Yeah. Um, so, emotions, as we know, a majority of us nurses here. Yeah. Or in, yeah. Um, so, emotions can lead to a physiological response. Yeah, so um, shaking, sweating, raised heartbeat, all those kind of things. Yeah, um, and certainly a physiological response can then go on and lead to a, um, a behavioural reaction as well. Yeah, so how we process information will interact how we behave based on our interpretation of that information. Yeah, if we're displaying negative behaviours, uh, then our emotions are not working in our favour. But the good news is we can certainly change that. Yeah, so if we can learn to modify our behaviours, then we can reverse manage our emotions. Yeah? Are you following me? Yeah? Beautiful. Okay, let's have a look at the physiological responses. Yeah? Um, so the limbic system is obviously the area of the brain which um, manages emotions. Yeah? And there's specialized uh, regions within the temporal cortex that manage the visual processing of facial expressions. Um, so the amygdala, which is this little green olive here, um, is responsible for. Um, uh, fearful and threatening stimuli um, and that uh, will send information directly to the hypothalamus and we'll end up with that fight or flight response potentially yeah so quite interestingly um, humans who have got um, damage to their um, amygdala might have um, impaired ability to recognize facial expressions of people particularly their facial expressions of fear so there you go so um, I want to move on and just do um, a couple of activities now these um, activities talk about emotions and also talk about triggering emotions as well. Um, so please, again, if you feel that you don't want to be part of this and turn your video off on this section, it's absolutely fine. And again, if you want, um, in retrospect, to talk to Sue or myself and ask us not to, you know, to edit out part of the recording, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so I've got some um, descriptive words up here. So describe a time when you felt a strong sense of one of these emotions. Now, I don't know if anyone is happy to take the lead on this and um, perhaps um, describe one of the emotions themselves. Um, I've got positive emotions and negative emotions up there. I think for the process of working through um, to learn to develop ourselves and using reflective practice, um, a negative emotion would probably be a good one to pick. Um, is anyone brave enough to um, discuss a, um, a, a time that you felt a strong sense of one of these emotions? I can always be the backup staff, so don't yeah. anyone, you know, say, well, if you want me to jump in, I'm, I'm good at this gear. Oh, go on then. Okay. Can right. you, are you able to describe one? It, it can be a positive or a negative. But, uh, oh, okay. I mean, you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, um, probably at, um, you know, work sometimes, you know, when I'm, I used to be a clinician and sometimes, you know, you, um, you get that sort of like, um, a frustrated sort of, you know, um, so combinations, I guess, of, you know, um, you know, a bit angry, a bit frustrated, you know, that you couldn't get done what you wanted to do. And so then you would, um, you know, not, I, you'd, I'd feel like you couldn't really get your words out. So you wanted to make something change because you were frustrated because you had so much to do and there was so much going on and you really wanted to do something with your patients, but you couldn't connect with anybody and then you ran out of words and you just ended up probably looking quite passive aggressive because you just started storming around the place to get stuff done. Great. Okay. That's awesome. wanted to do stuff. Great. So you just um, made that connection, yeah, between the emotions that you felt and the behaviours moving forward. Yeah. So fantastic. Yeah. So um, and also just um, with this activity. So maybe just have a think in your head, maybe just of one of those um, particularly negative emotions that, that that you can think of in a situation in your head. Um, and as Sue's just really eloquently put, so describe that emotion um, and describe how that emotion made you behave. 
Mm. Yeah. And then just start to think, well, take yourself out of yourself. How would that look from somebody else? What behavior is somebody else witnessing of you? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So we need to be aware of our emotional responses and we need to be aware of that behavioral response that happens because of those emotions. Um, and if we can be um, forewarned about our own behaviors and, you know, have some idea a bit more of a of self-awareness as to, as to what our own responses are, then it kind of gives us the step up to be able to manage our behaviors a little bit more effectively. Okay, let's move on. Um, so what are the top three emotions here that you really dislike feeling? Anyone happy to, you don't have to give me examples on this one, but any, any examples of which particular emotion you, you really, 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 really don't like feeling? I really hate feeling ashamed. Anyone else got any others? I don't like feeling stressed over things not, you know, um, fixing at work or, or, you know, things not working out and then the stress that you feel and, and then you go home with it and you, and you think, I shouldn't be feeling stressed, but I'm stressed. So, I, you know, I don't like that. And, Great. And what does the stress, how does the stress come out of you, you think, Alex? What do you do when you're stressed? I offload on my husband. <laughs> Are you sometimes reactive and a bit snippy with people? or Yeah, not and I'll, I'll, I'll um, continually go on about it. And uh, there's one of my colleagues will say, but you're choosing to do that, which is so true. Because yes. I am, and I, I can choose to deal with it in a different way. And she's totally right. Yes. So there is a point sometimes where people talk about you've got the choice to vent or you've got the choice to make a movement. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you can vent forever, but be aware that people don't have to listen. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So good point. That's good that you had a beautiful, honest friend who said that to you. Alex. Oh, yeah. She's good. <laughs> keeping it sorry around. sorry Steph, I'll stop no no good stuff I get excited all righty <laughs> so the the, oh. the main the main crux of this is to really think about you know how how do we react to stressful situations what's our go-to behaviors um is that an acceptable behavior yeah um are we managing our emotions and subsequently our behavior as well um and you know if if we're seeing that there's some sort of negative detriment there, you know, do you want to get better at it? Yeah. So recognizing that, yes, you know, I can perhaps work on, you know, that transfer between my emotions to my behaviors um, a little bit more effectively. Okay. So reflection. Okay. So thinking of um, emotionally intelligent behaviors, I just want to discuss some volatile, exa volatile examples of um, perhaps negative emotional intelligence that you may have seen in your workplace or not necessarily your workplace and anywhere really. But can you think of an example? So um, reflect on a time when you or someone you know demonstrated an emotional response that was indicative, sorry, that was not indicative of the actual situation. Yeah, so when there's been a situation and they have just blown out of, all, they've really shocked you with that, wow, where did that come from kind of behaviour. Anyone got an example they're happy to share? I've got one here if you're not. Regina here. Um, I used to work with a manager that when she became stressed or it was a really difficult conversation, she would laugh involuntarily. Oh. And it, it could be very uncomfortable <laughs> Um, particularly working in palliative care, um, where she would just suddenly giggle. <laughs> and it was, and, until you got to know her, it was quite off putting. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, particularly in a palliative care environment. Okay, all right. So you described the situation there. That's beautiful. All righty. Um, how did it make you feel? So you said it made you feel a little bit awkward. What, what else? What were the other feelings? And it, was it just you or other people within your um, group having the same? Other people as well, but I, I think at times I felt really embarrassed um, that that was her reaction and until I got to realise that it was just a nervous response, it wasn't meant to be laughing inappropriately um, and it's something that I know she's worked on very hard to try and uh, suppress. That's a difficult one too, uh, especially when it's a you know automated response. All right, so what were your actions in this situation? So if you're perhaps you're in this, you know, discussion with a you know patient um talking about a sensitive uh, you know palliative care context and she's started giggling how, how what were your reactions or the reactions of others in that situation 
Um, at the time, I think I reacted in terms of, um, for me, this is a really serious conversation and, you know, I, I would hope that you're taking this seriously as well. Um, and then, you know, she's talked about, oh, I, I didn't mean to laugh. It's just one of my nervous responses. Um, I'm really sorry. Um, so that's how I dealt with it at the time. Yeah, good. Okay. So addressing the situation, not just letting it go that it was, uh, you know, okay behaviour. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Alrighty, um, upon reflection, what could you have done differently? Well, personally, I think you managed that one quite well. Um, but this whole activity is just about, um, again, looking at um, how do the behaviours that we exhibit, um, how, how do other, other people react to that? Yeah, so um, all of these activities, they are up on the learning management system if you want to have a look at them or, um, you know, look at them in more detail later or perhaps use them with a, a participant out on placement. Yeah. Okay, so um, awareness of our emotions, yes, yeah? so this is what we're talking about, yeah, so um, purpose of that exercise obviously to raise awareness of our responses to our behaviour, yeah, um, so we need to have awareness of how our response process works, um, an awareness of the behaviours that happen with that emotional response um, and that interception that happens there to stop that negative behaviour um, and obviously change your approach moving forwards. Okay. All happy with that so far? Fantastic. All right. Now, it is very important, however, to be aware that, you know, we can jump from zero to hero, in fact, zero to not hero, very, very quickly, can't we? Yeah. Um, so particularly when we're triggered. Yeah. So we can jump from that situation where everything's just fine and dandy. And then all of a sudden somebody has said something that has triggered you and you are like raging. Yeah. Um, so really important to be aware um, of the high speed that we can jump, yeah, from quietly listening to that, uh, it really, really igniting our emotions. Um, also need to be aware that um, fast decision making, it, it does have its benefits, it has its places, yeah, particularly if you're in a, um, you know, high stress environment where decisions need to be made quickly, boom, 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 yeah, so it's, it's certainly got its place. Um, you know, on the fly, um, decision making, um, tackling tasks, um, and also for our fight or flight response that we spoke about earlier, yeah. Um, negative side of making very fast, quick reactions, um, it sometimes draws on bias and assumptions that we've made of people or situations to make that quick decision. Um, and obviously it can also be guided by our emotions, yeah, which may or may not have a good outcome. So opposite to that, we've got our nice little tortoise there, yeah, so our slow, deliberate, logical tortoise. So it's not always easy. I'm not saying that we can innately, you know, stop our emotions, slow things down, but we can certainly practice that behavior of slowing things down. Um, so when we slow down our thought process, we can reshape our judgment, we can reinterpret our judgment, um, and just start to shape and change that response that we're going to make. Alright, so we need to access that slow, deliberate thought process to find solutions um, and change our behaviors. Um, and there are psychological tools out there that can help us um, to, to, to make that change. Alright, so the first things we need to do is take control. Yeah, so accept your emotions. Your emotions are not a bad thing. Yeah, they're there to protect us, aren't they? Part of that fight or flight response. Um, but we do need to work on that ability to whoa, slow everything down. Yeah, slow those emotions down before we exhibit that behavior that's going to put us in a tricky situation. So, and we do have that control over our emotional reactions um, to in intercept um, those emotional behaviors. Okay, now, anyone heard of um, Brene Brown? So Brené Brown is, um, I, I think she's fantastic, she's awesome. So she's a, um, a researcher um, and a storyteller from um, uh, the University of Houston. Um, and she spent the past couple of decades really exploring emotional intelligence, in particular courage, vulnerability, um, shame and empathy. Um, and she's written some awesome books. Um, Dare to Lead is one of the very good ones, which you'll find in a lot of leadership courses. Um, and Brené spoke about this concept of the stormy first draft. So when we were in a situation and we we're having a conversation with somebody, um, uh, we perhaps haven't gathered the full truth of a situation. Yeah. And rather than ask or clarify what the situation is, we develop our own little stormy first draft. Right. So we fill in the gaps um, and we try and uh, we, we start to make assumptions and we assume things about the person or the situation, which may not necessarily be true. They might be based on truths. But the situation, the facts of this stormy first draft that we're developing are now not true. Yeah, are you following me? So when we've developed this stormy first draft, what happens is it starts to um, influence 
um, our emotions, our behaviors, and how we treat other people. Yeah. So it's really, really important that we are aware that we do this. Who, who does this? I can't see people's faces when I have to rely on Sue to tell me, but um, I've certainly done it. Yeah. Filled in the gaps when I didn't know a full situation and I kind of made my own little edit to it. Yeah. We make assumptions. We totally do. Absolutely yes. make assumptions. So I'll give you an example that uh, might help you if, if you're not really following what I'm saying. So um, you're um, on a, um, a short tea break in the office. Yeah. And you've had this awesome student with you out on placement. They've just been phenomenal and they've been really, really keen and they want to talk particularly about um, cares at end of life. So you decide, right, we're on a break. I'm going to do an impromptu little teaching session. This is awesome. Um, so you sit there and, you know, she's quite in, uh, interactive and involved with what you're saying. And then towards the end of the conversation, she pulls out a phone and starts sort of scrolling through the phone, looking at messages. What's the stormy first draft that you think might be likely that might be being developed here by the by the um, the mentor? I'm boring her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, clearly I'm boring her. Yes, yeah, I mean, she's not interested. She's got her phone out. Here she is scrolling away. Yeah. Anything else? Any other, you know, step on from that? Like, you, you know, you, you might be boring her. What's another assumption that you could make potentially? We can start to look at things like, oh, do you mean if you're boring her, she's not interested. I'm a bad um, educator. Do you know what I mean she's she's not interested in anything I've got to say? Yeah. So all of a sudden, you can see this context building, building, building irrationally. Yeah. Or, or you could turn it around and say she's rude. Absolutely, absolutely. It's not about you. It's about her. You can make starting making judgments about her in a derogatory way that she's, you know, she's disrespectful, she's rude, or whatever. Beautiful. Love that example. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, and in fact, in this little scenario that I've set up here, the situation is that um, the, the participant um, actually took her daughter to hospital that morning um, and she's waiting on an important phone call from the doctor um, to find out how her daughter's going. Yeah. Um, and she's just sat in a break and she's been politely listening to you the whole time, not wanting to be rude. You're about to go back on the floor. And so she just quickly wants to check. So perfectly reasonable explanation for her to be on her phone. Yeah, but we've done this nasty, stormy first draft and decided she's a horrible person. Do you know what I mean, she doesn't like us. We're a terrible educator. She doesn't like us. She's not interested. Yeah. Uh, can you all relate to maybe you have, have doing that or have seen that in action at some point? Definitely. Yeah, good. OK, so it's about um, asking um, like the following questions to try and identify the accuracy of, of your version of what's going on. So think about that situation. Yeah, think about that story that you may have made up um, and the emotions that you felt at that time because they're influencing your behaviours, right? Um, how did your body react? Yeah, so again, we're looking at your um, nonverbal communication. What are you saying with your, you know, your body positioning? Um, and what were your beliefs and thoughts during that situation? Yeah. Um, the other things you want to try and identify, um, what more do I need to learn and understand about this situation? Yeah, so in this situation, she needed to have a chat with the with the student, didn't she, the participant, and just say, hey, what's going on? Do you know what I mean? Um, I see you've got your phone there. Is, is everything OK? Yeah, and then identifying, actually, she's got her own little emotional journey going on there that, uh, that she may well need supporting on as well. Um, what do I need to learn and understand about the other person in the story? Um, and what more do I need to learn and understand about myself? Yeah, so in that situation, there are assumptions that were jumped to very quickly. Yeah, so just learning, okay, just need to step back, maybe see the other person's point of view first before um, being judgmental and making um, assumptions about people. Okay, who has been in this situation? Yeah, um, a cognitive hijack, yeah, where we've been triggered by something and we have gone to zero, not to hero, definitely not to hero in 110 kilometers an hour. Yeah, we have just gone from quiet contemplation and talking to full on rage, yeah. Um, so again, this is um, Daniel Goldman um, identified the concept of uh, your amygdala hijack. Yeah, so amygdala hijack occurs when your amygdala responds to stress, that fight or flight response. Um, it overrides the frontal lobe and totally and utterly disables reasonable and rational thought. It goes out the window at high speed. Yeah. Um, so it can be triggered by um, an event or a, you know, a situation, um, but it allows any bias that you may have for that person or situation to take over with gusto. 
yeah mm -hmm. um you develop i've got anger and frustration i would probably move that to straight up and say you're, you're full-on rage in some situations yeah um and you can develop a totally irrational response um and your behavior will reflect that yeah mm -hmm. you've got this total cognitive and emotional hijack that's going on in this situation yeah so can yeah. you also for me i i must admit i do the reverse I actually, I go very, very quiet. If I've been triggered, I actually, it, it triggers in me kind of this, I've done something wrong. So then I feel ashamed of myself and then I can, I actually internalize it okay. because I take it personally. All right. Okay, good. Okay. So good self-awareness on that. So yeah. what do you think your behavior is? What, what behaviors are you exhibiting um, to other people in that situation? I, I can probably look like I'm, I'm I'm stressed but I'm very quiet and I'm stressed or yeah and I don't say much I, I look like I'm sulking actually okay sometimes. yeah and actually. I and I and another thing I suggest is people probably think you're withdrawn and you don't care yeah. yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so good uh, excellent example yeah so just really being aware of how that looks to other people um and intercepting it. and i'm not gonna lie it feels really false and it feels really fake um, and it is because it's a practice process that you're trying to do to uh you know be aware of that so just take time to understand okay your emotions what's going on right there you've been triggered all right er, you're withdrawing all right i need to override this da, 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 da. yeah and just taking the time to process it yeah using that slow turtle response yeah it might be also the other response, which is the freeze. So we have the fight, flight, and freeze. Fight, and I flight. Think, yeah, and I think that might be the last one, like you're frozen. Because I think I get that comment a lot that, hey, you look so calm, John. I'm, but inside I'm panicking, but I'm just frozen. I'm, 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 I'm the deer with the headlights kind of guy. Ah, okay. <laughs> so we've got the deer, the turtle, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Get a very good. Raging bull. Raging bull, yeah. <laughs> So we can all relate with this concept, right? I think um, I, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone that's not been triggered in their lives. Yeah. Um, and, and we do it and we we do it at very, very high speed um, in some situations, don't we? Yeah. Mm. So we need to look at, um, you know, what sort of things trigger us. Yeah. Can it does anyone oh, you don't have to necessarily speak on a personal front, but things which might uh, um, common emotional triggers for people? Particularly think about the industry that we're working in. Um, perhaps I have an example. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I can't see your faces at the moment, guys. Um, I, um, I'm working in an aged care facility and um, I um, went to work the other day. My colleagues um, were really behind because uh, Akira was off sick. And um, I walked through the facility and various breakfasts hadn't been delivered. I found a couple of rooms where the curtains hadn't been opened and people were still asleep when it was really already breakfast time. Mm -hmm. um, and I went literally like from zero to a hundred. Um, and I spoke to a couple of carers in the hallway. It was totally unprofessional. Uh, totally inappropriate because they were all really busy and they all, all did a great job and they couldn't have done what we normally do because they were a staff member down. Um, what was my trigger was that my mum is in aged care in Germany at the moment, she's dying, and I had just been told that she doesn't receive good care there. She actually had had a fall and um, I basically translated um, my emotions into my workplace um it took me probably only all of 30 minutes to realize all of this and i had to apologize for my colleague to my colleagues and explain my situation and they um they were really supportive and understood um apart from one um and uh, even that i'll understand um i was in charge of the facility that morning and i kind of um, yeah, didn't do myself proud and didn't help anyone out. They were already stressed. So not a good moment. And uh, I guess you can really just learn from that kind of uh, experience. Mm, absolutely. Um, well, first, thank you for sharing that, Sylvia. And I'm sorry to hear about your mum. And, but it's, it's, it's 
those raw emotions isn't it and it's it's when it's taken in that context and they catch up on you when you don't even realize um that this you know the situation is building and then all of a sudden you've said something or you've done something and it's just like where did that come from i didn't even know that that was brewing and oh, there it is the verbal diary has come out and i can't take it back however well done for you for reflecting on that and um going back and um you know chatting to the people and letting them know your context because i think that's another big part of that isn't it I mean, do, have you all seen the um uh, the example of the 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 icebergs yeah with the, there's two big icebergs in the water and then like you know when we see people we see the top of it we see what people look like we see the things they say we see the things they do yeah but underneath that sits their emotional journey you know the stories of what's going on with our families things that are happening what's going on with marriages what's going on with kids what's going on with schooling education blah 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 there's so much that sits under the water that we just don't see um, and we are an iceberg and the person that we're talking to and they are an iceberg as well so there's a whole lot of stuff going on under the water that none of us can see yeah so we just need to make sure that we have that conversations and just be aware um the person that i'm seeing in front of me may be saying and displaying one thing but they've got an emotional journey going on themselves that i might not necessarily understand um um or or need to stand in understand in that context however it might be affecting their behaviors and what i'm saying and doing and my experiences might be affecting my behaviors yeah beautiful thank you for sharing that that was a brilliant example wonderful example all righty so we need to be aware of how do we stop this cognitive hijack situation going on right yeah we don't want it it's not necessarily productive yeah um so we need to think about how we can get over that beautiful so grounding anyone heard of grounding theories about grounding different things we can do to ground ourselves so just to let you know what grounding is so um it's an activity that can reconnect you to the earth yeah so electrical charges in the earth having a positive response on your body so if you don't like that spiritual analogy to it you can also just look at it as a second just to pause take a few moments gather your thoughts and adjust your behaviors yeah so it's again it's pulling in that concept of the slow deliberate logical tortoise yeah let's get back to our thinking phase how can i ground myself quickly anyone got any examples of any grounding experiences or grounding techniques that they use i can talk through this one step because my daughter um has got um they call it emotionally unstable uh I can't remember what it is now. So a couple of years ago, she had a really um, bad time and she got stuck in the bath and she, cause it's her safe place and she couldn't get out of the bath. So I rang my friend um, who works in mental health and she helped me ground Claire so I could get her out of the bath. Cause obviously it wasn't safe where she was. And it was as simple as we had a tube of toothpaste and all she had to do was touch the red part on, a tooth, on the toothpaste and then she touched my nose and then she touched her nose and it was just taking her out of that situation to allow her to actually come, come down really from that 100% that she was at. It took us about 15 minutes, but we finally got her out of the bath. So, um, and cause she lost it again and then we brought her back and I think I used, I don't know, a candle next time or something cause the toothpaste, um, but it was enough to just, ground her and distract her and I think that's the key it was about distracting yourself from that cognitive hijack beautiful um, exactly right I've used it a lot as well sometimes if I'm feeling overwhelmed and I'm feeling like I'm going to go like this I just go oh and just just touch that I don't know what there and it's just enough to just say no more just put a halt on it Perfect, Angie. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's about slowing down. Ooh, let's just slow down time. Let's just give ourselves that break just to pause. Mm -hmm. um, take on board well, what's going on first. What's going on around me? Yeah. What are my yeah. emotions right in this situation? And let's just pause time just for a second because I just need to stop the earth just for a sec. Yeah. Um, so any technique that does that. So the old fashioned way, count to 10. It still does the job. Yeah. Um, and you're absolutely right. So those things about physically grounding yourself, so touching the earth, yeah, work beautifully. So 
Um, the example that you gave was a really, really good one. And it's one that's used for patients with obviously with um, high levels of anxiety and PTSD is another example mm -hmm. of, um, of um, people that that works really, really well with um, in a leadership capacity. So um, speaking about you guys, we probably need to do something a little bit more uh, less obvious. Um, so things like just touching, maybe picking up a, if you've got a water bottle in your hand, just feeling that water bottle, taking a few seconds to really concentrate. What does this water bottle feel like? So I'm holding the bottle. It feels smooth. It feels cool. I can feel there's fluid in it and really trying to be descriptive about what it is that you are feeling at that time taking your mind out of that rage emotional hijack situation and back to the present yeah back to that grounding what am i feeling what am i touching yeah if you've got nothing in your hands do you know what i mean like touch your nails yeah what do my nails feel like they feel rough around the side do they feel smooth how does my nan man manicure feel today yeah take yourself out <laughs> take yourself out of that negative reality that you're in just for a second just to just reset for a minute yeah anyone got any other examples of grounding techniques that they've used I might share mine um it's uh, my one was a tip from my grandma um before i present anything in public because i was scared of talking in front of my class or the public and all she said to me is put this coin on your sh in your shoe and if you're nervous just feel it but now that you're explaining this, now it makes sense because I still do that. And I, I think I still do that if, when I have an interview for a job. I oh, still have a coin in my shoe um, that people can't see, but I'm fiddling on it. I'm trying to feel is it the, the tails or the head? So like, yeah, but now it makes sense. Now that you explain it's uh, grounding. She, she was a wise lady. There you go. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm going to give that one to my daughter, if you don't mind. <laughs> That's a great example. Love it. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so the other th other ones are um, taking time to describe a colour. Yeah, so um, I can see Sue's got some curtains in the background on, on her screen. Yeah, so they to me, I'm not sure what colour they are, but they look like a sort of a magenta colour. So I can see I can see blacks, I can see purples, I can see hues of pink, maybe even a little bit of yellow in there. Yeah, so really taking the time to really, really deeply describe what that colour is again to, to break that situation and give yourself that pause, that moment of, um, of, of reflective time just to ooh, just stop the world just for a second. Um, what other examples have we got? So breathing deeply, <sighs> just take a breath. Yeah, let's just ground ourselves with a breath. Yeah, um, concentrate on a part of your body that's moving. Yeah, so again, John, I love your example there with the coin, that's fantastic. Um, listening, listening to what's going on in your surroundings. You know, what's going on in the next room? Can you hear the printer going? Can you hear uh, I don't know, a washing machine or a tumble dryer going or a hand dryer or, or something going on? Yeah, um, feel your body. Do it appropriately, people. Okay, otherwise <laughs> we're going to our world of other problems. <laughs> um, recite something. Recite something in your head. So maybe you've got a mantra, yeah, um, but just, just within your head, yeah. Um, Visualise. Yeah, so sometimes if I feel really, really stressed and I feel that there's no way that I can get out of it, I visually, um, I sort of, in my head, try to visualise scrunching up a ball and like kicking it with all my fury into the bin. Yeah, so sometimes I do that quite frequently as well. So lots of whatever works for you. Yeah, experiment. Yeah, but grounding really, really does work. It's that break in time just to pause, pause, reflect, adapt my behaviors quickly. Oh, my God, I'm about to do this. Let's stop. Let's adapt. Yeah. All right. So slowing down our behaviors, not reacting on our triggers. Yeah. So identifying that emotional reaction. Remove yourself from the situation. Now, it's not always possible to remove yourself from a triggered situation. Yeah. Um, if you can good but make sure you address it again yeah so always need to come back to that situation yeah so maybe book an appointment just say yeah you know, it's perfectly acceptable to say actually at the moment i'm that angry that um i don't think i want to follow this conversation right now but we really do need to follow this up let's book an appointment right now for nine o'clock tomorrow morning yeah and that can give both of you an opportunity to oh, let's just go home and sleep on it yeah and then hopefully you can come back in a more rational state of mind the next day to have a proper conversation about it and talk about the facts not necessarily the emotions that have adapted our behaviors um all righty um so grounding yep so we need to be able to go ahead and do that so the um the other thing that i always think about with um <clears throat> sorry just going back to leaving a situation is um looking at things with a traffic light system yep so just try and adjust the situation just think you know what what's the level of my cognitive ability at this moment yeah um so can i go ahead and talk through this rationally without bringing my emotions into this situation am i in a, in a green light situation 
am I in an orange light situation where you're I'm still a bit tense and you know I still might say something that I don't necessarily mean um or am I in a red light situation I'm about to rip your head off and tell you all kinds of uh, terrible names that I really shouldn't you know say to somebody yeah so if you're in the red zone make that action to move yeah get out of that situation there um and but make a, uh, an appointment to come back and readdress it so that it's not left as the elephant in the room ongoing Alrighty, um, give yourself time to recover in these situations, yeah, um, and don't do the blame game, yeah, because when we sit there and go through and, you know, reflective practice is a wonderful thing, but sometimes if we do it too much, we end up um, with those, those feelings and those emotions and we end up bringing this huge veil of shame over ourselves, don't we, yeah, shame and guilt, yeah, it's not helpful to anybody. All right. So be kind to yourself. You've made a mistake. Yeah, we can go back and we can address that. Like Sylvia said earlier, Yeah, go back and apologize and explain our perspective, our side of the story as to why we behave like that. Yeah. So that's a fantastic way of resolving that situation and letting people know where you're at. Um, challenge your thoughts as well. So reflect on the situation objectively. Yeah. Don't let it be this resolving, you know, spiraling situation, however. Um, and make sure that you understand what your emotions were, what your behaviours were, um, and how you chose to respond, yeah? And be aware that you can go back. You can go back now retrospectively and identify what you can do if this situation happens again. Well, what were those triggers? What happened? What triggered me to go from zero to definitely not hero very, very quickly? Yeah, what triggered me? What did they say? What did they do? Um, and what was my immediate response? So when I feel that response again, I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up that water bottle and I'm going to feel the living daylights out of it and feel what it, you know, what the texture is, what it feels like, how heavy it is. Yeah. Good stuff. Alrighty. Let me get my PowerPoint back on. Let's have a look. And I think a really good point to add to that, Steph, is sometimes we won't react the same way because it depends on what our accumulated stressors and triggers are. So sometimes we're very stressed and we've got things, too many things going on in our life and we're not taking time out for our own mental health to realise we're, we're human. And so when we've got too many things on, like, you know, Sylvia with, you know, her share before, you know, she's got so much on going on. That's why she had that reaction probably so quickly because she had a lot of accumulated stress in her and that, that trigger that she normally would probably not react that way, it, it, it happened. That's so it. Just, yeah, you've really got to be mindful of those accumulated stresses that we get in life as well. Yeah, I love what you said there about, you know, being mindful. So taking time out just to, uh, you know, be kind to yourself. Absolutely be kind to yourself. Yeah, do what you need to do to, 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 to calm yourself, identify what's going on, reflect on the situation. Mm. All righty. Uh, you guys see my screen still, yeah? Yes. All right. So um, another part of the, those four key stages that we spoke about was um, social awareness. Yeah. So um, how do we begin to develop our social awareness? Well, um, we can start with um, understanding with what's happening around you, um, understanding others' feelings. Yeah. So trying to develop empathy. All right. Now, I am a true believer that empathy is a skill that we can develop we can hone um so empathy being um that situation where you can try and put yourself in another person's shoes and try to understand their perspective yeah um, and apply understanding of your emotions and behaviors to the outside world so internal reflections to an outside behavioral reaction so has anyone seen this video I absolutely adore this video. Um, I might just watch it. I'm really aware we're running out of time rapidly. I apologize. Um, but I will just get you to watch this if that's all right. Um, so it, it's from Brene Brown. So she's talking at a conference, but just really explaining the concept of empathy and why it's so different from sympathy um, and why it's so important, particularly in the industry that we're in, in palliative care, and why it's such an important skill that we need to hone. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection, sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space 
when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Yeah, what did you guys think of that? I love Brene Brown. Sorry, I did go on about her quite a bit. I think she's awesome. It's excellent. Really good. Yeah, she's great, isn't she? Okay, so um, just some cautions about um, empathy. Um, I think um, in the caring profession, in the profession that we're in, um, I think we all pretty much naturally um, have got, have got um, good, strong, empathetic skills. Um, but because we have that innate ability, um, we are also very prone to burnout as well. Um, so just being aware um, of self-care that Sue spoke about earlier, just being mindful that uh, we need to take time out to, to look after ourselves as well. Um, other things to talk about with empathy, um, don't assume you know how someone feels. Yeah, you need to ask them, how, you know, how does that make you feel? How are you feeling about this situation? Yeah, um, so just, just make sure that you're, you're really dealing with those um, robust conversations about it. Now, um, the other thing that um, Brené Brown spoke about was vulnerability. Now, this is a, a really awesome video here again you can follow the link it's on it's on the learning management system um, it goes on for about 11 minutes i'm not going to play it now but she talks a lot about vulnerability um, and what it means to be vulnerable um so being vulnerable is grasping um, uncertainty risk and putting in yourself in a, an element of um, emotional exposure yeah so brené brown she said um, the first thing you look for in someone and the last thing you're willing to show is vulnerability yeah so what I mean by vulnerability? Well, um, if you Google it, um, the definition of vulnerability is um, it's defined as the quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. So, oh my God, why on earth should we be vulnerable? Well, when we put ourselves forward and we be vulnerable, we um, move forward with courage. Yeah. So it's about um, showing up and being seen. Yeah. So expressing ourselves emotionally by breaking down barriers. So finding those common truths, those common norms with people. Yeah. Um, so an example of that might be um, if you've made a mistake um, to, uh, to own it, yeah, to go back and say, actually, I've made this mistake um, and shown that you've learned from that experience as well. So you're putting yourself in a situation where uh, you might be vulnerable, but also uh, corresponding with that, you need to have an element of trust within your group as well. However, one always needs to come before the other and that vulnerability comes first to establish trust. Yeah. So um, why is vulnerability classed um, as important for emotional intelligence, do you think? Well, I really think like um, just having um, shared um, with you my um, work experience earlier, um, I felt a degree of vulnerability, I guess, um, because um, it, it was it was a situation I wasn't proud of myself and um, at the same time, I felt it might be beneficial to share because, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, we all have a life outside of this very moment where we don't uh, behave in our very best uh, manners. Um, so it, it, I guess you, 
making yourself vulnerable is it can be um, very helpful to others because they um, they can acknowledge that and they can um, in return um, open up about their own experiences uh, with with more ease um, and with more trust. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so as soon as we show vulnerability, you're absolutely right. It proves that, you know, we're not this perfect being. Yeah, it makes you more relatable. Yeah, um, yeah. people connect with people that have a weakness. Yeah, um, be because well, going back to that empathy video, we, we can all relate, hopefully, to how that person feels. And we know that it's a horrible place to be and it's a horrible feeling. Um, and so you just you automatically get that sense of compassion for them and connection a little bit. Yeah, because you shared that experience, you know what a horrible dark place it is to be in. Yeah. Um, so you automatically want to go and, and, and help and it helps build these bonds. Yeah. Um, so the thing I just want to talk about now is about perfectionism. Yeah. Who who can relate to uh, having perfectionist traits? I can definitely stick my hand up to that. Yeah. Um, and that feeling of, um, you know, everything needs to be perfect. We need to make sure everything in, in our little world is perfect. And, you know, being a being a very high achiever. Yeah. But we need to be aware that perfectionism is not sustainable. Yeah. So when we try to uh, uh, be perfect all the time or to do things to the very, very highest, you know, excel above what our best abilities are, um, we're embracing feelings of shame. Yeah. So perfectionism and shame sit hand in hand. Yeah. So when we don't hit those feelings of perfectionism, um, we do sit in this area of shame and guilt, judgment and blame. Yeah. If you don't succeed. So perfectionism is not a good trait to have. Yeah. So we all need to look at ways of trying to be a bit more vulnerable, um, exposing ourselves, not in that context of the word. <laughs> Let's not go exposing ourselves at work like that, but exposing ourselves vulnerably to be um, emotionally vulnerable. Yeah. Um, so Brené Brown said, I am I am what I accomplish um, and how well you accomplish it. Um, please perform perfect. Yes, we just need to move away from that perfectionist um, state of mind. Yeah. Um, when we act with perfect, uh, perfectionism, um, it's. Um, incorporates the fear of um, making mistakes yeah we need to make mistakes to move forward to be creative and innovative we need to experiment yeah and by the nature of experimentation that is about it might have a good outcome it might not we don't know it's an experiment yeah but we're not ever going to be creative if we sit in this air of perfectionism yeah so just being vulnerable and moving forward with uh, vulnerability um now i want to show you this one here we go even superman is vulnerable to kryptonite <laughs> yeah um, so how do we how do we do vulnerability? Not sure if that's the correct English, but uh, show up and be seen. So even things like just turning up in the morning and saying hello to the people in your in your office or in your ward or in your work environment, yeah, it creates that normal um, normalization, yeah, where you can um, rationalize and identify with somebody as a person, not just your colleague, yeah. Um, understand that vulnerability is the birthplace of courage, yeah. Um, vulnerability is not knowing victory or defeat, it's understanding the necessity of both. Um, and to get to a shared goal um, and to be successful, we're gonna make mistakes, yeah? Mistakes happen, yeah? And mistakes can actually be helpful. We can really learn solid um, messages from, from making mistakes. So it's not a bad thing to make a mistake as long as we reflect on it, um, lessons learned and move forward from that. So linked into vulnerability is that concept of trust, yeah? So um, we need teams to trust one another for vulnerability to really, really be effective. All right, so the signs um, that um, trust um, and emotional intelligence isn't present in a team can be things like, you know, a, a really poor workplace culture. Um, so gossiping, uh, you might feel tension, you know, when you walk in a room and it's like, ooh, uncomfortable. Um, so that general feeling of being unsafe, um, bullying um, and discrimination as well. Okay, I'm going to try and wrap this up a little bit because I'm well aware that we're zooming past six o'clock. So if anyone does need to leave, please feel free. I apologise. Um, let's jump forward a little bit. Um, yeah, so just basically um, identifying ways to build trust and vulnerability. Um, if you're in a situation, ask for help. Yeah, that's you showing vulnerability. There's nothing wrong with asking for help, putting your hand up and saying, actually, I don't understand. Can you explain again? Yeah, because when you do that, um, it's... it's um, it shows that other people can do the same thing. And now all of a sudden we've got this expanding effect of trust and vulnerability that everybody is building this trust and we can all uh, develop this uh, fantastic team dynamic a lot better. Alrighty. So there we go, building trust. 
Alrighty, um, I thank you all. Um, now, I just want to let you know just a couple of things there. So um, there is a um, certificate of participation, which you guys can actually access um, for all of the webinars. So if you guys have been to some previous webinars, you can um, download that certificate of participation. Um, I'll show you where that is in just a second. Um, but the one thing I do, I want you to just try and take something away from this, if you guys are happy to. Um, so what one thing from this session can you commit to um, to work on to improve your emotional intelligence? intelligence is anyone happy to share something you're not allowed to go until you share something no as a joke <laughs> um i think one of the things i've done i think more um purposefully particularly through covid is um taking that moment of grounding myself by looking at a sunset or um stopping and watching the birds particularly in between uh, clients where, you know, you're dashing in and out sometimes of homes or different facilities and just having that, taking that 30, even just 30 seconds to try and clear your mind and be present before you move on to the next patient and the next um, task. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us are overwhelmed with COVID and everything that's happening at the moment, but I found for me that's been really helpful. Yeah, I love that you said being present. It, it it encapsulates everything, does it? Just being present, taking the time to understand what is going on right now. Let's just take in the surroundings right now, what's going on, that grounding. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. Anyone else? Anyone else taking anything away? Oh, I, I'm going to be much slower in my, my um, reactions. Good. You know, just try and process it for longer and think about it and slow it all down and not get so wound up <laughs> yeah yeah take that time just to whew, yeah good <laughs> ground yourself all right fantastic guys i will just show you very very quickly if if i may and then i will leave you be um can you see my screen here um should be on the learning management system so you all should have access to the learning management system yeah um, if you go into the Pepper Mentoring site and you go into the Mentoring Hub, um, all our resources are here from all of our sessions, Emotional ses Intelligence Session, this one is, is there and the recording will be up in a few days. If you scroll down, doo -doo -doo, there you go, you can find your certificate of participation and there we go. All right, and it's just got a little space there for you to um, put some reflections on there as well for your CPD. So please feel free to download those um, as evidence of your learning. I thank you very, very much for your participation. Um, thank you for showing your beautiful faces. It does make it much easier for me um, and it's really lovely to see you and, and your engagement in the session. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any questions or anything? No, just to say thank you, it was very thank well you. timed for me. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> this week that I'm going. Yeah, thank you very much. It was good. It was good. brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, really, really oh. good. All right, no worries. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Practice grounding. Be happy. All right, okay. and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Bye. 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 Bye